Wow, that's a great song. So it's great to be back. Uh, Sonia and I, as you know, had the honor uh, to be at the GLC, the Global Leadership Conference. Uh, the title of the theme was Empowered. And you know, um, we all know that God is all powerful, but we are all not powerful. But God says that we can do all things through him who gives us strength, yet we still at times have to continue to learn how to tap into that strength, right? Yeah. Through faith. Um, it was awesome as well as uh, Fred shared, Sonia and I uh, uh, definitely humbly and honored and fearfully accepted the reinstatement of evangelist and woman's ministry leader. Uh, we've, uh, you know, I was appointed in 1996 uh, and I don't take it lightly. Um, God had humbled me. Uh, for the last couple years, you know, I had to uh, step out of the ministry. You guys all know the story coming here. Uh, if anything, I can tell you that God is a loving, compassionate, never giving up on you, do over God. The only thing you have to understand is how do I continue to be strong in the grace? And that's what we're going to talk about. So I accept the, the, the mantle of evangelists, not because I'm anything, because if I said no, I believe I would, tell, I would be telling God no. But I do know one thing. God chooses the foolish to teach the wise. It does say that. He picks, so, you know, I am nothing. And I never want to forget that. I, on my best day, need grace. I cannot believe it. So I'm going to share some things I feel like God has put on my heart and taught me how to be strong in the grace. But before they do that, I am going to go on my knees and say a prayer because uh, I, um, I need all the help I can get. Come on, Dear Heavenly Father, God, I uh, get on my knees because, um, first of all, you changed my life in 1993 in a way I never believed could happen. You took the stronghold of addictions, uh, immorality, and a lifestyle that I was just, uh, I thought there was, you know, I just didn't know how to get out. And uh, I experienced your incredible power, your grace, your mercy, but the continual strength I can ask from you to change. And God, the only thing that's gotten the way in between there is me again. And I realized, God, help me to realize that you don't put us down when you say, uh, we, we uh, can do nothing apart from you. You let us know that you created us uh, really to be Ferraris. But if we don't let you be the mechanic and we just go down the street to like a neighbor that says he works on cars uh, and we do it our own way, we're, not, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna start having problems. Uh -oh. So help us to, to continue to let you drive us. Amen. You to lead us, God. And I just pray you're with me as I speak the word. Help me to speak it clear, humbly, but help your power to come through from the word so everybody in here can walk away with what they need to hear. Yes. God, I, I am honored and humbled. I'm not worthy to serve you, but because you've said the words, you've allowed me to understand Christ. Uh, I, I am allowed to, to, to represent you only because you've asked me. Thank you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All, right, All right. Okay, so... How do we connect with the one and only God in a deep personal relationship? Now, many of you could answer that through the scriptures, right? Through Christ. But how do you really continue to get a deeper connection? I'm trying to figure that out as well. But Paul says, I want to know Christ. And I want to know the res resurrection and somehow attain the resurrection from the dead. And, and when Paul said that, he was all in. He was in, he was like on fire for God. And you're looking at him like, what do you mean, Paul? You're like building churches and overcoming things and doing things that we're blown away as, as other human beings. But yet his heart was like, I am never going to tire from striving to know you more. And that's what it's about. Jesus says in Luke 19, don't turn there, verse 9. He says, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. And then he sums it up and says, for the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. 
We understand that the only reason Jesus came down is to save every human being. No one is good apart from God. No one can be saved by a good moral life. Because we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. So just understand that so you won't be fixated on trying to justify yourself by your good behavior. Not that you won't be a better person, but it's not about being, being good and checking your boxes to go, oh, now I'm saved. It's about acknowledging God Almighty is a savior of the world and you need to be saved and continually need to be sustained in his grace yeah, come on. and he came to seek and save the lost once you figure it out and are converted and become a true disciple the way the bible teaches it's the only way we can know yeah. so it, 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 there's no room for error on salvation because the bible's very clear on that so churches that spin it and give different a lot of the truth but then they tell you something that's not in the bible that's not totally correct you can't say God understands. No, no, the, it's, the issue is they're not being humble to the word because no one's saved. But pride is, is terrible when you try to interpret the scriptures different. Yeah. Because that's basically saying, I'll do it my way, but I still want you as my God. No, no, we can't do that, right? Come on, the title of the lesson is, Be Strong in the Grace. Okay. Be Strong in His Grace. Look in um, um, uh, Mark 2, 22. You guys with me? Yes. It's great to have my brother and sister-in-law here yes. from Durant, Oklahoma. Yes. We got to visit them on the way here. It was like two years ago when we were driving on the way here. And uh, uh, they, they, they live out more in a country type area where they have a lot of land and horses. And it's just like, it's not like the city. It's like, it's amazing. Yeah. And we're sitting out there and he's looking at me and he's going, what are you doing? Kind of like Stephen, you can relate to that, right? Stephen, remember when you said to your brother, what are you doing? Uh, but <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, it's in love. He's like, man, you're going from L.A. to Florida. You don't, I mean, you haven't been there. Where are you going? And he was just concerned, but I, I appreciated the talk with him. And I was like thinking to myself, going, what am I doing? <laughs> and then I think I went in the back room and prayed again because it was, it was a pit stop from Los Angeles all the way to Orlando. And I didn't know any of you. I just rolled in. And you guys have been so gracious and accepting us and loving us. And we knew the Sullivans, and there was a plan, but uh, it's a miracle what's yeah. happened. And, and I want you to see that in your life, no matter what's going on. God can always do miracles if you're up or down, wherever you're at. Stay in the game with the Lord, and he'll take you through. And you'll be able to look in hindsight and learn what, what he's teaching you. But if you pop out before you learn, you will never get it. Yeah. You'll be bitter. You won't yeah. get better. you got to stay in the obedience even when it hurts. Amen? Because God is always working because he loves you. So let's look in um, uh, Mark 2, I mean Mark 20, Mark 5, excuse me, Mark, Mark 5 and, uh, in verse 22. Mark 5, 22. Come on, Chris. And it says here, Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus fell at his feet, he pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter's dying. Please come and put your hand on her, hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with them. Now, I want to show you, there's a couple things that we can see about Jesus already. That he's walking and there's a man really in pain for his daughter. Jesus is very compassionate. He sees this, this dad. I mean, you imagine if you're a parent, right? And your kid is in very much pain. Or even if you have a loved one that's in very much pain, it, 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 it hurts you. You're like, please help me. And he right away is moved and goes with her. But on the way, we read in verse 24, so Jesus went with them. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman who was there had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Very interesting. 12 years of suffering. 12 years of not finding answers. And not only is she exhausting all her finances for her self-recovery, it gets worse. Wow. In verse 27, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, very important here, because she thought. See, faith starts with a thought. 
if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, know, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. See, the first thing you got to understand is that she heard about Jesus. In verse 27, when she heard about Jesus. See, you got to hear the message. You got to hear someone share their faith with you. You got to hear about the real Jesus. Not the counterfeit Jesus today that I grew up in at a church that said Jesus and they had some truths, but it was totally off on really calling us on how Jesus defines what a Christian is in the scriptures. And that's why I was shocked at 31 when I first studied the Bible. I always believed in God and Jesus, but I, oh my gosh, when I really allowed myself to humble for the word with imperfect people that, but were striving to live it out, I'd never seen that. Yeah. And that's where they said, you can pray and God can heal you from the sufferings of your addiction. You can change this. Yes. You can, even though you went to rehab, you can change this. Come on. Really? Okay. That's a different kind of prayer that I've understood. Yeah. But then I said, God, I'm going to give it all I got. Because yeah. I started being shown the scriptures. Yeah. I remember, and you guys know my story when I was smoking cigarettes. How do I change that? Yeah. I remember I had to pray. The pain didn't go away, but the, but, but, but the overcoming one day at a time did. The drinking, the light, the swearing, everything about me was really opposite of Jesus. And there's still many things now, but the issue is now I'm in the current of going, I want to be more like you, and I got a lot to work on. Amen. But God gave me the power. God can give you the power. On, Are you suffering? When you hear about Jesus, you got to make action. This, this lady is suffering for 12 years, and she has to push through a crowd. Do you think there's an excuse for any of us not to seek God with our heart? This girl is hurting. She has a menstrual issue. She's got to be weak, bleeding for seven, uh, 12 years. Yeah. I don't think she felt like getting up, going outside, and m pushing through a mob crowd. Right. And try to, <laughs> just trying to get to him already. I mean, come on. That's some effort. Yeah. Bible says make every effort. Amen. So uh, people say, I'm trying. No, that, no, 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 you're not trying. You're sitting. Oh. And, you, and, and, and you're looking out the window going, there's a lion in the road. Oh. You can't make excuses. Come excuses on. stop God's power because you're saying that there's something that's in your life that doesn't allow you to get to Jesus. Come Nothing on. can stop a man or woman when they really want the true Jesus. Yeah. Right. Um, it says here that um, she gets to him and then she thought. She thought. Because what did she hear about Jesus? She heard about Jesus. we got to know what did she hear. Well, when you read the scriptures, you know what she heard because we can read what we know. Amen. And now she's like, whoa, this guy's preaching and what he's doing, I can have that too. Yes. And when she got to him, at once Jesus realized that power had gone out of him. Now you think about that. You think about that. How many people are pressing around Jesus that weren't getting diddly? How many people, I mean, it was virtually impossible almost it seemed to get close to Jesus. But the woman fought her way desperately, weakened by her 12 years of an illness that can't be cured. She spent everything. She's already, she's poor because she spent everything. And she had to get through a crowd that most people that were healthy go, I'm not going into that. How many people like huge mob crowds? Oh, right, let's go. there's a huge crowd. Let's go run into that. <laughs> but she did because it meant she understood, wow, this is God that I'm connecting with. Yeah. This isn't some guy. This is God. And see, 
Intellectually, you can go, oh, I'm going to go to church. No, no, you got to realize I get to connect with the real God if I find the real Jesus. Amen. So she fights her way, and what a difference between the crowds who are curious about Jesus and the few who reach out and touch him. See, there's millions of people that are curious or want to hear the word or even mean well, but they're not getting no power. They're around Jesus. They go back and forth. But are they, are they, are, is power coming out in them? He looks through a whole crowd. He goes, I felt power come out of me. And it wasn't like everybody was like, yeah, I'm fired up. Thanks, Lord. The, 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 crew, the crew was all around him like, let me see what's going on. This is the Jesus. I want to get to Jesus. How you doing? I'm going to trip on the stage. See, I was going to fly out, but I didn't want to scare you the first time. You guys are first-time visitors. I don't want to hurt you. See, when there's first-time people here, usually when there's no visitors, which is very rare, so I never jump out of the stage. Because if there's no visitors in the church, then there's no people touching Jesus. Because once you see it, you came to seek and save the lost, right? So once you got it, you're not just coming on your own. That'd be selfish. Once you found it, you're going, hey, you got to come see this Jesus. Amen. Come on, Chris. But we have to understand that only a few really connect in a personal relationship with God. It's not because they're special. It's because they get it. You got to have, it's got Jesus, it's got, there's nothing that has to be more important. See, she even had to go through and God was compassionate. God let her waste all her money on all different belief systems and ways to try to get help. And got her to the point where she had nowhere else to go. Amen, we got to do that. Let's just be real. Sometimes we're stubborn. Some, like for me, it took me 31 years. God had just had to keep going, oh gosh. Yeah, you're saying your little prayers under your bed at night, but you're, you know, smoking a dope before you go. You know, you're not changing. You're just praying. I don't get this. You, you're, you're really deceived, Chris. You actually pray and actually mean well, but then you live you complete. Nothing happens. You're just living like a, you don't, you're unrecognizable as a Christian. <laughs> and we see that. That's the problem, uh, obviously, w- w- with many people, and maybe some of you feel that way, that you're familiar with Jesus, but nothing in your lives is being changed or bettered by your acquaintance or your familiarity with Jesus. It's only faith that releases God's healing power. Faith. Faith is mysterious, yet it's tangible. Faith can be seen in hindsight of obedience, but, it, but it before going into it, fear and faith only are the two doors. Yeah. It's do I really believe God can do it? And that means you're going to obey or you're going to go into door number two, which is fear and yourself doing it, going, I hope it's going to work, but you still may be courageous. But then once you obey God, you can't, you just believe what God said is true and you're obedient. As you continue to live the lifestyle, you can look back and see how God has helped you. Yeah even when you were completely wrong. Because as you're obeying, your understanding obeying is also under obeying the principle of grace and repentance. So you're not just sinning it up. Once you sin, you realize, okay, I know this is wrong now, God, and I want to change. Please help me. See what I'm saying? Look in uh, uh, um, 2 Timothy 2.1. You know, our claim really is that God is good. Goodness is, God is goodness. And basically, we base this, if we really want to be strong in the grace, is that on a, on a continual seeking of God, yeah. a continual repentant and longing to mature spiritually is when we understand the strength in His amazing grace. Continually seeking God, continually acknowledging you're wrong and changing and not being defensive or wanting up on each other. Well, you do it, that way you no, just be humble. Yes. Every day, I realize, I told my wife, I've got to speak less. Because I, I sin. I go, oh gosh, because I'm trying to figure out how to be strong in the grace. And I go, every day I can feel accused and fail. It's not a day goes by, I don't put my foot in my mouth, say something I shouldn't. Uh, and, then, and then I go, okay, God, that, I, I want to I be stronger. And I'm not trying to earn it, but I'm trying to go, how do I, how do I be strong in the grace? Well, I really examine the word. We're going to look at that later. But look in verse, look at chapter uh, 2 Timothy 2, 1. Timothy, my son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. That's be strong in your failures. Be strong in your 
unworthiness. And be strong in your, you know, he doesn't give A, B, C, D, and F. But we get F. And he's saying be strong in that F. Because, because that's not why you're being saved. But I want, you to do, I want you to be, when you see the love, and I love you no less, even when you're a mess. That's good, that's catchy, write that down. I love you even more. I, I, it doesn't, I don't love less, but I, I'm, I'm wanting you to be moved by how much I love you. And when you start to get moved by the grace, you go, this is amazing. And that's how that song came up. I think that person was like, wow, this is unbelievable. This is a, this, wow, great. It's ama amazing grace. Because you realize that he loves you in spite of you, and that should make you want to be a better man or woman. That should be why you're motivated to, do, to change and love and, 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 and be energized because you're strong in the grace. You know, thousands of Christians returned to their homes after going to the GLC. They're all over the world. We had two, over 2,000 people there. I mean, Russia, India, Philippines, New Zealand, Australia, Mexico City. I mean, all over. I, I know so many of them, but it was just unbelievable. And... They come back, and then the test is they're all there with 2,000 people. It's easy to rah, rah with 2,000 people and have amazing leaders preaching the word with the power of God, yeah. cranking, and you're sitting you're in a group of 2,000 singing, Hail, hail, I am Judah. I mean, you could, be a you could be a moose and still be excited by the energy, just all around everybody, but, 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 but you still can be in that crowd and get nothing. But when you leave and get on the plane... And you find that you don't have the right seat and you're stuck between two people and they're both extra large and you got no room and you just got back from the GLC and you're hungry and you had to buy a sandwich for your last 20 bucks at the airport because you forgot to get something in your backpack. And now the GLC's fumes are starting to fade and you're on the plane and it's delayed. And then you get home and you're tired and then you're in your own bed and then you, okay, you got to get up for work and you're still tired and the boss... Instead of going, you look radiant as ever, gives you a little assignment and says, you didn't do this well last week either. Can you do this right? Oh. And you're like, wait a minute, I just got empowered by Jesus. <laughs> no, the same, de the monotonous rut of your life. Now the test is who are you? Are you only you excited when people are around you or have you been with Jesus? And that's even without going to the GLC. If you have a quiet time and you read the Bible and you pray and you're trying to change, when you leave that quiet time, the rest of the day, can you draw back on that and go, I'm with Jesus? Or are you down and out and mopey and complaining? And don't get me wrong, you may be down and out and mopey at times because we all do that. But do you catch yourself and pull up, pull up. You ever heard someone sharing good news and it's coming off real negative? <laughs> like, I got good news and they're sharing about somebody. Well, I remember when you were drunk in the street and, we got, and everybody's like, pull up, pull up. <laughs> Pull up. This is good news. Don't, you don't need to share all that junk. That's a long time ago. Now you're an awesome person. Right? So when we wake up in our beds once again, in our ordinary lives, and our trials come our way, and we only have the rich memories of hearing powerful messages preached from God's word and the rich deep fellowship, what do we do? After you leave today, what do you do? The real question is what are we going to do in our local churches? Come on. Chad shared Operation Orlando. Woo! Will you be empowered to be more productive and effective to help your church leaders to seek and save the lost like Jesus called us to? Or are you going to have to be like crowbarred because you said Jesus is Lord, so we're assuming you want to be a Christian. No one put a gun to your head. But you said that, but then you still kind of walk around in the church like, we got to walk on eggshells. Will you want to help me out? Oh. You know, no, no, you said Jesus is Lord. So just say he's not Lord and leave if you don't want, if you don't want help. And now, 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 or do you want to be willing? I want to be willing. It doesn't mean I'm always going to have a good attitude. But I'm going to change quickly because I'm going to continue to draw power from God when I recognize my attitudes and my crankiness and my mopiness and all the stuff that you guys have too. We're, all, we're not that unique. Just let me know that. You're not that unique. I'm not either. We all have the same little problems. Right? You know, Ashley shared this scripture, just write it down. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20, for the kingdom of God is not a lot of talk. It's not just a lot of talk, it's, it's the, it is living by God's power. Yeah. So when you really walk in the talk, you're not perfect, you're not better than anybody, but you're walking and striving to go by God's power. Yeah. Point number one, don't be strong in deliberate sin. 
See, you want to be strong in the grace. You, sin and grace don't go together. It's like oil and water. Now, we're all sinners, but if you just keep sinning, even out of ignorance, you just, maybe you got, you don't even know. You've just been doing it so long, you're like in, you know, it's like pet sins. The little pet's been around so long that, you, you, know, it's like, you, know, you know it's wrong, but you still let it be there. It's like somehow it got in there. So let, let's look at uh, um, uh, Psalm 17, verse 1. Don't be strong in deliberate sin. And what's that mean? Well, you got to know what sin is then. Because some people might not know what sin is. And this is the only way you know what sin is. is if, Because, you know, believe it or not, your conscience can be your guide. But after a while, if you never get in the scriptures, your conscience can deceive you. The Bible says my conscience is clear, but it does not make me innocent. Paul says that. Paul, your conscience is not your guide. If you go by your own conscience without the word of God, you're going to lead yourself into a wrong situation to be right with God. Remember I said loving your family is not that abnormal. To love and care for your blood relatives, Al Capone does that. Oh. Gangsters do that. It's, that's not unique. Amen, give yourself a pat on the back. That was genetically programmed. Oh. God born, when you have a baby, remember I said when you have a little baby, comes out of, out of the womb of your wife, you're like looking at it, it you, you just met it, it's like three minutes, and you're like, you'll die for it. How does that happen? There's just a genetic tie. You're like, how are you going to die for that little baby? You can go watch other babies be born. You're like, oh, that's a cute little thing. Or actually, he looks like an old man, but it's cute. <laughs> but my baby's great. <laughs> Why do we get so connected when we have a baby? Because it's ours and God programmed it. You don't even have nothing to do with it. Like, because it's just, you just love what comes out of you. <laughs> but that's not, that's, that, that's of God, but that's not really, that, that's not superior. Everybody should be good family people. But to love strangers and love people that aren't blood connected and different races and nationalities and love and embrace them just like you would your sister growing up. Now we're talking about the power of Jesus. Talk about it, Chris. Let's yeah. look at uh, Psalm 17.1. Okay. Hear me, Lord. My plea is just. Listen to my cry. Hear my prayer. It does not rise from deceitful lips. Let my vindication come from you. May your eyes see what is right. Though you probe my heart, though you examine me at night and test me, you will find that I have planned no evil. My mouth has not transgressed. Now, the Bible says, uh, you know, in, in, in the NLT, he says in verse 3, you've tested my thoughts, examined my heart at night, you've scrutinized me and found nothing wrong. I've determined not to sin in what I say. Now, this is David. Now, you've got to ask yourself, was David saying he was sinless? No. David is showing us what grace is. Grace changed him. Uh, he was far from being sinless, right? Yeah. He, he got to a point where he drifted so bad that way before Bathsheba, he wasn't doing well, by the way. You don't just get on a rooftop and be the leader of God's people and just on a whim go, hey, no, go get her. No, he's already struggling. If you look at the chapters before, he stopped really seeking God. Yeah. You'll see in that time period of a couple chapters, he doesn't seek advice from the prophets, and he stopped seeking. If you see the beginning of David as a small guy, he was crying out to God. He was like there, and then it goes kind of dead. He's leading, things are going great, he's had some great blessings from God, and then, and then when, at the time when kings go to war, he stays back. So already he's not leading his people. And then he drifts, you know, we know the rest, commits adultery, sets it up, tries to cover it up, hidden deceit. Conspiracy has one of his best guys, most loyal men killed, and then still tries to cover it up until Nathan has to come in and lay him out nine months later. So for nine months, he was still leading and not in the right position with God. Wow. So he gets exposed. The baby, is, the baby dies, which was painful, but that was God's uh, punishment. Uh, and we know, you know, David even says, I cannot, uh, uh, I, he cannot come back to me. I can only go to him. So that's one of great scripture reference, by the way, that if you're an infant or a young child, not old enough to understand faith, yep. you, you, you go to heaven. Because he, he goes, you know, he says that. He goes, I cannot, I, he cannot come back to me. I can only go to him. Yep. But we see the great change that David made. Yeah. Uh, David's claim was an understanding of his relationship with God. David freely acknowledged his own sins. Nevertheless, his relationship with God was one of close fellowship, constant repentance, and forgiveness. 
His claim to goodness, therefore, was based on his continual seeking after God. And God even said, David is a man after my own heart. Amen. He, he, he praised David. God said, wow, this is a dude that I'm all in with. Because this guy never stops getting back up and coming after me. Amen. And yeah, there's consequences. And I punished him, God says. But he was a man after my own heart. And you can bet he changed. Yes. Look in uh, Psalm 32 about deliberate sin. What about you? Uh, I've been in deliberate sin. And I can tell you right now, uh, God won't be mocked. Yes. And uh, you will be... Uh, found out he doesn't miss a beat he does he's very patient he does let you know if you if you acknowledge your sin and things like that he's working with you yeah. if he allows pain or discipline it's usually because you're contemptuous or stubborn yeah. the bible if you look up the word stubborn in the bible it's not a good thing to be with him no. prideful terrible defensive terrible uh <laughs> it, oh you're done if you 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 keep being defensive he's going to bring the hammer yeah. and you're going to you're going to be in a fetal position with your thumb in your mouth. I've been there. And it could be emotionally, it could be financially, it could be physically, it could be whatever it takes to get your attention because he'd rather, short of killing your physical life, get you to get your attention to get right with God. What good is it to enter the kingdom with less an eye, with, with two eyes than, than lose an eye? He says, gouge out your eye. Cut your hand off. It's better to enter the kingdom with a hand cut off than to go on sinning. On. See, he's saying the spiritual life when you die is way more important than now. Right. So get it, get focused. Right. Look, at, look in verse 32, 1. Here's David's repentant heart and grace. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against him and whose, who, and whose spirit is no deceit. Check that out. No deceit in your spirit. You really got to be honest with yourself, the word of God, and God, and then have a conversation with someone that you're close to in the church that has the same godly convictions, and be honest. Yes. Because I'm telling you right now, dishonesty has many different outfits. And they can even fool you. It can be the quiet not speaking up when you could. It can be you don't feel good about somebody and you don't address it. That's, that's deceit. You're acting nice when you're not. You're acting like there's no problem when there is. You're a people pleasing and you might think, well, I don't want to hurt his feelings. No, you're deceitful. Wow. The, the Bible says here, it's convicting. It says, blessed is the one who the sin, who, whose sin the Lord does not count against him and in whose spirit is no deceit. Oh my gosh transparency all the way yeah. with God and with people. Let me tell you something. We all should be saying sorry. I mean, unless I'm just the worst dude in the shed because I, I, I need to say sorry and, 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 and go up to people because I think of that before that. I go, I can't be fake. And number two, I got to forgive because God says, if I don't forgive, he won't forgive me. And then also I can't present myself in a way that's not honest because that's deceit. So I'm in trouble. So that's why, you know, I told you this. One time as a Christian, when I had my company, Klopek Investment Management, I remember, um, you know, I was a Christian, and I remember uh, my boss, I told you this, he called me real quick, and I had the papers on my desk, and he goes, did you call those subs and get those bids? And I go, yeah, 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 I did. I'm waiting for a call. I didn't. This, the paper was right there. I was looking at it in my mind. I was going, I'll do it right after. I go, oh, my gosh, he told me to do it. I forgot. I hung up, and I went, oh, my gosh. And, and, and I wouldn't have done that if I wasn't a Christian. My spirit started bothering me. I go, oh, gosh, I, that was a lie. And then, and then I could have just justified, well, he doesn't matter. No, no, I lied. You can't. I, and then, I, then, then this is the real test. I had to call him back up, the owner of the company, John, John Stewart Luxury Homes. And I had to call John. He spelled it with J-O-N. And, and, and the economy was in the tubes and the recession was going down. And my company had, 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 had finished doing 100 homes, but I phased out because all the work was gone and I got attached to a luxury guy because the luxury rich guys that were building houses still had a little money and it was, hadn't hit them yet. So I got to be a foreman on it and I had to call him and I had to call him back. And I remember, the, why did I do that? I go, I could lose my job because I was feeling really challenged in my heart because I have the spirit of God and I was grieving and I felt this is wrong. I can't just go on and let time go by. Okay. You can't just go, time goes by and now it's fine. No, it's a lie. So I had to call him and say, John, 
it's Chris again. I just told you I called those guys. I, I didn't. Um, I lied. And I, when I go back there, especially as an actor, I'm in sense of memory right now. I'm still feeling, I'm feeling the same way. I just felt so embarrassed, so humiliated, so uncomfortable. And I just waited. And there was a pause. And he goes, uh, uh, all right. I'm going to do it right now. And he goes, all right, yeah, okay, just do it right now. I said, thank you, thank you, thank you. I hang up the phone. Because I couldn't say, like, uh, you know, I, I, I just kept, you know, he didn't fire me. He just said, all right. And he didn't fire me. But the only reason I did that, because I realized if I let a lie linger, I'm done. It's going to haunt me the rest of, to the grave. Because, see, you can't say, well, God understands. No, no, well, you have to bring it forth. That's strong in the grace. And if I got fired, that would have been a consequence. But I would have believed that God would have let me get another job because I'm continuing to be strong in the grace. Yeah. See what I'm saying? But we're tempted to lie because we're afraid of the man consequences more than God. Yeah. And see, if you do what's right, even if you do what's wrong, <laughs> after what's wrong, you do what's right. God's going to take care of you even though the, the chips may fall. Because we're going we're gonna to make, make bad mistakes at times. But you're going to make less ones. But you can't worry about your life, where you live, what you'll do. you got to be honest. You guys with me? Yes. So, um, and then we see in verse uh, 3, it says, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away th through my groaning all day long. Let me tell you something. If you're not doing well spiritually and not getting real, you're, I don't care how much you sleep and how much you eat right, you're going to feel tired and worn out. You're going to just, because the Bible says, guess what, I'm, you can't go on if you're saying you're a Christian and walking in the grace, you, you're going to be, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to feel psychologically and physically tired. You're going to be exhausted more than not. You're all tired. And, and, it's, and, and I'm just telling you, that's part of the deal if you don't repent. Yeah. Look at this. He goes, for day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped. In the heat of the summer, you know, you walk out in this humidity, you hang out a little while and do a little chores, you're dripping in sweat, right? I let Coco, my little doggy, out, go out around the back yard just to go to the restroom. If I let her out there more than 10 minutes, and she's, <laughs> I let her in, she's like flapping up water and almost dead. She's a pug, she can't really breathe very good in the humidity, but you know what I mean? It's tiring out there. But the Bible says here, that day and night, your, his hand, so if you're feeling sapped or heavy or weights on you, you got to ask yourself, where are you at with God? And there's not one thing you can excuse. If you really ask yourself that and sit silent and go, God, I want to know, please bring it up. Is there anything wrong in my heart with me and before you? It will come up. Little things will come up. You'll, you, it, you won't have to go, I wonder. No, it'll come up. And you'll know exactly who to go to. Don't let it stay. Then look at five. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Wow. That's why David had a, a heart after uh, 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 a man after God's own heart. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Don't take for granted. You can just make up your mind. One of these days, I'm going to go find God. It is an opportunity. God gives all people opportunities, but it's not just like he's there whenever I need him. God, Bible says that time can run out and there's reasons. And when you die, your eternity's fixed. Don't just think and convince your mind if, that you're right with God when you haven't examined the scriptures. Yeah. Because that would be very prideful. That would be almost thinking that you just kind of think naturally like God, which is really not correct. Yeah. Come on, Chris. You are my hiding place. Verse 7, you will protect me from trouble. You will surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like a horse or a mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Now look at that. That's the stubbornness. Don't be like one of those people. Don't be a person that just takes forever to get open and be repentant and defensive. And we got to like... Don't be a person that has to be walked on eggshells. Be a disciple. Be a person that's open and humble and bites their tongue and owns it and doesn't get up with trust issues and what are you going No, Dude, just be grateful someone cares enough to get in your life and go, how you doing? How you doing with that? I'm concerned. What are you talking about? All right, I'm not talking about anything. You know, just keep going. 
bro, you want some help? Yes, I would. Okay, I'll work with you. Because I thought, that guy doesn't, that woman's not acting like a disciple. Because if he said Jesus is Lord, your sins are forgiven, you got the Holy Spirit, then you have the ability to be willing to say, I'm going to fight to get right. Amen. But if you're defensive and prideful, that's not attractive. doesn't mean I'm not going to come in strong because I care too much. Come on, Chris. But, you know, only you can decide. And the Bible says here in verse 10, many are the woes of the wicked, but the love, Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. Isn't that awesome? Don't be deliberate in sin. The point, uh, point two is you need to be strong in his scriptures. Amen. Let me tell you something. There's a lot of people in the world that think they don't need to read their Bibles. I was one of them for 31 years. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have talked bad against the Bible. But sometimes we just even think to read the word of God is God's eternal voice on paper. It's not a book Satan tries to make. It's just another big holy book. No, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit that carried men along through, all, through, through the ages to write it down. It's from God. It's flawless. That takes faith. Come on. But when you read it, you've got to realize that divine power and understanding and wisdom that's not on this earth is coming in your brain. Come on. Look at this scripture. Look in uh, Matthew 22, verse 29. And you know, when people stop reading their Bibles, you can see faith draining from their eyes. They start to not be as obedient and excited about serving God's kingdom and being part of God's kingdom because they get ungrateful. Yeah. And they fix their eyes on things of the world. Look in Matthew 22, 29. You guys with me? Jesus replied, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. Wow. And then he's making a point to some people about marriage, but he, he says at the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God has said to you? I am the God of Abraham and God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And that means he's the God of you, if Jesus is Lord, living and active. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. The key, though, is in verse 29. He's refuting people who think they have a relationship with God, Jewish Pharisees. And he says, you guys are in error. And he's not saying, you're, everybody sins. He's saying, you don't know the scriptures. Yeah. And that means if you don't know the scriptures, you're not going to be able to grasp the power of God. Ooh, come on. Very clear. You don't know the scriptures or the power of God. If you don't strive to be asking God to help you understand and be empowered by the word, and when you do understand that, no one can stop you from reading the Bible every day. If I don't read the Bible, I'm struggling. It's not because, oh, did you read your Bible today? i got to read my Bible. I'm the minister. I better read my Bible. No, I'm like, I need God. Amen. And sometimes it'll be in the morning with a really controlled quiet time. Other times it'll be at the gym where I'll stop in between reps and hold up my phone and 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 completely forget about working out because I'm just digging. So yeah, I'm just telling you, wherever I, I, Bible, I have access everywhere I go. Yeah. And I realize sometimes in my mind, I'm always thinking, praying, word comes to me and I'll stop and I'll even have to write it down. Why? I've learned that it saves my life. Amen. Check, check out Psalm 119. Psalm 119, uh, 97. See, if you're not reading the Bible, then it's like, not reading directions on medication that's been given to you for the first time. You get medication from a prescription and you don't, you don't want the pharmacies in, but no problem. How you doing? I got it. You check, I don't need any help. Chink. Then you take it home and you're just like opening the bottle and just plopping a few in the hand and go, let's hope this works. You would never do that. Right? Some of us drive our cars into the ground and we don't get our oil changed to read the manual on that. But then see, that's a good lesson. If you read the manual about your car and it says you should take it and have your tires aligned and rotated every 5,000 miles, you'll get longer mileage. You should check the air pressure in your tires every so often because you'll, the, the tires won't wear out and you'll get better gas mileage. And you definitely need to change the oil for sure, consistently, or the engine will lose out and you're gonna run it down and lose a lot of the value on that car. 
And, if, and so it's like if you read the manual instructions, then you read the manual for your life to get to heaven. So now look, let's look at uh, uh, Psalm 119. Psalm 119 in verse 97. And I want to challenge you. If you've been not in the habit of reading your Bible the way you know that God would want you to, I want to challenge you to start today. And I want you to go, God Almighty, I want to see the power and I want you to empower me with your scriptures. And you have a good prayer every time you open the scriptures. And if you're lost or don't know what to read, talk to somebody. And say, what can, where can you start? And a good place to start is in John or any of the Gospels. And just read till you're moved. Don't make it like, I got to read this much. It's not about earning anything. Read till you're moved. But get on your knees and ask God Almighty to open your heart and mind and help you understand the scriptures and grab, grasp power by faith. Amen. Look in uh, verse uh, 97. On, Tell me if, this, if this, this scripture doesn't declare how much uh, he loves the word. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. So you get wisdom from the scriptures yeah. if you meditate. Wisdom. I have more insight than all my teachers for I meditate on your statues. He's not saying that in pride. He's like blown away. Wow. I have more understanding than the elders for I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path so I might obey your word. See, sin stops you to obey. When you're in sin, you don't feel spiritual. You don't want to even read the Bible. It's like, you know, if you eat a full birthday cake, you don't want to go out and play football. You want to just pass out and take a nap. Verse, I mean, 102. I have not departed from your laws. For you yourself have taught me. See, when you're reading the Bible, it's like God himself sitting there teaching you. Because in John, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh. And, and, and it made its home. So Jesus became flesh. Jesus was the walking Word. So people, and Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen me in the flesh and believe. So we can read the scriptures, and it's like having a conversation with God and the Spirit if your faith can be empowered. To be, and that's what God, God says to believe it. It's just, are you doubting it? Wow. It's, not, it's, it's not broken. God's already laid it all out. It's your problem that you're not being empowered because you don't still believe it if you're not being empowered. You're not believing it's important enough to take a half hour to read the Bible out of your busy schedule. If you did believe you got this power from God, you would, you, 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 it would be very clear there'd be time. So get your faith. It says here in, um, uh, so then it says here, uh, I have, in verse 22, I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. You gain understanding. It's one thing reading something, but understanding it, or, 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 or being in some situation, but not understanding. Isn't it amazing? You can hear something, read something, but still not understand. When you understand, the, the light bulb goes, ding, oh my gosh, this is of great worth. This is, this is amazing. Yeah. Um, and then it says here in verse 5, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet, a light on my path. See, in your life, it's how you live your life. And if you went out in the middle of the desert when it was no moon, without anything, you wouldn't be able to move. You'd hear a lot of animals and things, but you wouldn't be able to see. And your eyes wouldn't even adjust if there was no moon. It'd just be pitch black. Yeah. It was real cloudy. You'd have to have a light. And see, he's saying, we, don't, we see by our eyes. You don't need faith. God gave you eyes. You can be an atheist and walk all around and lead your life and make decisions with your brain. But if you don't use the word of God, you're going to live out your life missing salvation. Yes. Come on, or staying saved. That's the key. Fight the fight to the end. So, look at Titus chapter 2, verse 11. We're coming in for a landing. Awesome. Now, grace is what? I told you this. Grace is a continual seeking God with the willingness to repent and striving to understand more 
with God. Yeah. So you don't just seek God. The principle in the scripture says if the first step is you must seek him with all your heart to even come to faith and understand him. Right. But you don't just find him and stop seeking and go back to your other pattern. You got to keep God first. Greatest commandments, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So you keep seeking him because you're so blown away that he cares about you. And if you were the only person on planet Earth, he would have still came down and died for you. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are very, of his very own, eager to do what is good. So, grace, is grace teaching you to say no to ungodliness? But you can go, I can't change that. Then you're not understanding grace. Because there's no excuse, because the power it talks about, it says here, it teaches us to say no and, and, and to worldly passions and live self-controlled, self-controlled lives. The power of the Holy Spirit gives you self-control. Yeah. So there's the power of God healed the woman after 12 years of paying every penny she had and going after every other way to fix it, and it didn't fix. And now she goes, I got to go to God. And the power of God, because her faith was desperate, which was good. Sometimes it's good to be desperate and in a corner. Yep. Because that's, that's where God, that's a good place to be sometimes. When, you're, when the odds are all against you and you, you feel like you're, you can't do anything. That's probably a good place for you. Because now all you have to do is go to God. There's nowhere to go. There's no atheists in a foxhole in a war. No matter what they say, they're going to start crying out for God. Because we're innately, instinctually, deep, deep down created by God. Say no. Well, what about the freedom in Christ? You're right. But see, if you don't have faith, you don't understand freedom in Christ. See, if everybody understood freedom in Christ, we wouldn't have policemen or laws. Even the world says we got to have laws. That you can't punch that guy in the face. You can't hold that guy up. You can't take that purse out of Macy's without paying for it. Why aren't you being self-controlled? Well, because you can't control yourself, we have to put legal people with guns to arrest you. Because you're not free in Christ. If you're free in Christ, you'd never do something like that. Well, why can't you stop using those drugs? Because it's an addiction. It's a disease. It is an addiction, but it's not a disease because God would be evil if he gave you a disease. You got cancer, you're going to hell. You better repent of that cancer. How, how could you have a disease from God you can't change? And he tells you it's sin, drunkenness. How can you be an alcoholic and keep drinking and say, I just can't change and go to hell? That's wrong. God can change it. The world lies and says it's a disease. A disease cannot be cured unless God cures it. You can't repent of a disease. Right. You can't be told to repent of cancer. You can't be told to repent of something that you can't change without God. Come on. Right? Yes. So are you dispositioned to be addicted? Yeah, I am. My DNA gravitates toward uh, compulsive to behavior. My DNA has to say no. I've been taught to say no. Come on, to go, you know, when I first got converted, I said no more. At 31, I was like, okay, I need to say no to stop hanging around people I hung around with. So I said, no, but they're friends. Well, they're not going to be my friends because I, I, it's more important for me to be right with God and I don't want to be around that stuff. So they took it personal. I said, hey, no offense, I just don't do that stuff anymore. I'm going to say no from going to bars and clubs. Why? Because I can just be strong and have a glass of water and be relatable. Hey, how you doing? I, have you heard about Jesus? Shut up! <laughs> you, you don't throw pearls to swine. You don't try to go reach out to people that are wasted. They're not going to get it. They may talk all day. Oh, yeah, God, praise God. I love God. Yeah. God's awesome. Yeah, I remember God was with me. Yeah. You call me the next morning. Who is this? What do we talk about? Right? Now, here's the kicker. 
This is two things. If you do these two things, you're going to be good. If you really want to be free, if you really want to be free, you have to overcome your love of wealth and your fear of death. If you really want to be free, you over, and, and you can say, well, I'm not wealthy, I don't love, no, no. Overcome yourself, your preservation, putting your life first and not putting God first. You could, because all of us here would probably say we're not wealthy. Every one of you in this room, I would dare say you're wealthy compared to the 8 billion people. Look at the case studies. Don't feel bad. I think it's not fair either because I'm an American. But if you have an apartment, if you have food, clothing, and shelter, you're very wealthy in the world's eyes. Now, that doesn't mean, don't be rubbing your mouth. I'm, you're, you're wealthy. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I thought Nick was like, Nick was like, I don't know if I believe that, bro. I'm a star. I'm a, I'm a star. I'm a starving student. I'm, I'm studying. You're studying to be wealthy, but he's a man of God. No, he's, a, he's an engineer. I'm just playing with him. I'm just kidding. But, but, but what I'm saying is that we can all, when we all take things from our perspective, we can, we can override it and feel sorry for ourselves. Yeah. You overcome your love and your pursuit of your little American dream and your little house and picket fence and life. No problem to have that. But if that's first and that's all it is, is you, your spouse and your children and your work and come home, that's not serving God. That's serving you. God's providing, but, but you have to overcome your love of self and wealth and overcome your fear of death. Why are you afraid to die? I mean, Fred, oh, I mean, uh, uh, Zico and Jutney jumped out of an airplane. So did Cassidy. Yeah. Who else jumped out of an airplane here? Oh, uh, wait, wait, who? Uh, yeah, Judy jumped out of an airplane yeah. at 13,000 feet in the GLC. And Diego would say, why would I jump out of a perfectly good plane? <laughs> what I'm saying, guys, is, now, now listen, 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 listen. Just, just to come in for landing, uh, honestly, where are you as far as uh, uh, overcoming your love of self? and your fear of death. You, you, you gotta continually seek God. It's gonna come up off and on. Don't, I'm not saying you're all, we're all walking, I don't have it down. You have, but if you stay close to God, it's like, I'm gonna die anywhere, but no one's ready for death. Yeah. Every time someone dies, no one's ready. Right. And I'm not saying that's the way we do. We, we got, God gave us a grieving process, not to not be sad, but everybody's gonna die, so why are you shocked when they die? I think we're just not built psychologically, emotionally, we feel bad, but we all know we die. But the most important thing you should know is when someone dies, if they could come back from the dead and tell you something, the, the, the one that went to hell and the one that went to heaven would say the same thing if you brought them both up. They'd say, get right with God. Yes. So the person that, de that, that did die, and we're not the judge, but say they went to hell and they could come back up, they would tell you the same thing as the person that died saved. Yep. Get right with God. They would say the same thing, really radical. That's the key, not to live for now and here in this little peasant mist of a life. Be grateful, but you're dead, and, and you're walking dead. And don't be morbidly thinking, but realize what are you living for? Do you invest in your spiritual well-being with the Lord? Or do you just wing it and think you're okay? Or maybe something gnaws on the back of your conscience every so often going, I know I got to do it. But you just time takes over and you don't do it. You're going to answer to God why you didn't do it. Yeah. Because it's grace that's waiting. Yeah. So how do you connect with the one and only God in a deep personal relationship and keep it deep? You continually seek God. You're strong in the grace and you're strong in the scriptures. The scriptures will give you power and help you understand grace and deepen in your faith. And you will not deliberately sin. When you sin, get real. Get help. Ask someone to pray for you. Be open. Don't keep it in yourself. Go, I need to change. And make sure there's no dishonesty in your life. And we all men are liars. So don't think, don't be embarrassed. Every one of you are cotton-picking, stinking liars. Oh. <laughs> A little pun on that, but we're all liars. The Bible says all people are liars. Yeah. Who has not lied? You just lied if you raised your hand. No, really, I, I, I hate to say it. I wish I could say I've never lied. I've lied. I hate that. I hate the fact that I have to say that, and I hope I don't do it again. But, and I'm striving not to, but it's hard sometimes when you're under pressure, and there's people, and there's situations, and there's no excuse, but it's hard, isn't it? So, guys, 
Be strong in the grace. Glory be to God. Amen. Woo!